Welcome to Retroality TV Presents Reimagine That with Chris Mann, offering refreshing reality with a retro twist. This week, Farrah Fawcett's secret longtime lover, Greg Lott, sounds off on Ryan O'Neill's new book. And we'll explore the world of the nocturnal subconscious with our very own dream weaver, Yvonne Reba. And now, introducing your host, Chris Mann. Thank you, Linda Kay, our vintage-voiced announcer and producer. And hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 11 of Reimagine That, the Retroality.tv podcast where retro pop meets forward thought. And we are back from kind of a spring break. Really wasn't anticipating this long of a break. And really, that's a misnomer because there wasn't any fun in the sun happening for me. A serious amount of magazine freelance work punctuated by some fun TV reality guilty pleasure finales Dancing with the Stars, American Idol, Celebrity Apprentice, Go Arsenio, and Nice Job Gladys and Half Pint Dancing. And in addition to all of that craziness, I've been dealing with some family drama, health issues, 20-something child rebellion issues. Not my child, but my sister's. But, you know, we all relate to family drama, don't we? And in a weird way, this all sort of ties in to the subject, the focus of this episode, which in part is Ryan O'Neill's new book about his storied, tumultuous relationship with the late Farrah Fawcett and their challenges raising their son, Redmond, who is now 27 and in trouble with the law once again because of his tragic drug addiction. Ryan O'Neill brings a lot of this to the forefront front in a way that has not been done in a public official manner yet. Farah was always rather protective of Redmond and she was pretty selective about what parts of herself she put out in the public eye. Although in the later years with the reality show Chasing Farah, but then more so the NBC documentary that aired about three years ago this month in May 2009, Farah's story, which really began began as a documentary called A Wing and a Prayer, but then became more of a love story type, exploitative, somewhat tabloidal perhaps, a documentary that ended up airing during sweeps and that was really overtaken by Ryan O'Neill in the final months of uh, Farrah's life, for better or worse. We'll leave that up to the viewer to decide. But Ryan now is presenting his story with Farah in Both of Us, his new book. And we've seen Ryan on The View. We've seen Ryan on The Today Show and a number of other interviews during his publicity tour this month. What we have on Reimagine That is an exclusive Greg Lott, Farah Fawcett's college sweetheart, her very close friend for 44 years, and her secret lover, apparently for the last 11 years of her life, he comes forward and really sounds off about Ryan's book. Things that he feels are inaccurate, unfair, mean-spirited, inappropriate, out-and-out, false, etc., in regards to Farah, who of course cannot speak for herself now. She couldn't speak for herself really in the final months of her life. Ryan O'Neill has more or less been her spokesperson, for lack of a better word, in the last three years. Alana Stewart also, who is the president of the Farrah Fawcett Foundation and who was a co-producer of the documentary. Uh, They both have books now. Greg Lott could write an amazing book, and we have the first of his three-part in-depth interview, beginning with this episode, and he really tells all about his relationship with Farah, what he knows about her relationship, or lack thereof, with Ryan O'Neill, and it really contradicts what Ryan has presented in this book, that they have had this on-again, off-again relationship that really was only punctuated by a few years of off again in the late 90s. I read the book cover to cover. I think that 
you should read the book and come to your own conclusions. But I've also read a lot of other stuff, and I've interviewed Craig Nevius, the executive producer, along with Farah of Farah's Story, who was cut out of the project in her final months when Ryan took the project over. Ryan said Farah wanted him out. That doesn't really jive with what I've heard from Craig and others. And Greg certainly brings a unique side to this story out into the public. He first sort of hit the scene in the final weeks of Ferris' life when he was barred access to her, as was Craig Nevius, Kate Jackson, and probably a number of others. They were the three that had been vocal about being not even able to speak to Farah in her final two and a half or so months. But he was barred from the funeral, as was Craig Nevius, and, you know, I can understand his anger. And he's really not happy with Ryan's book. So now he's bringing to the forefront more of what he knows and more of his story. The American media, for some reason, has largely missed this story, ignored it. You know, there is this thing called the celebrity Hollywood publicity machine, and all of these news outlets are owned by media entertainment conglomerates. So if there is a non-celebrity writing a book about a celebrity, and especially if that non-celebrity is discredited by celebrities close to the deceased celebrity, a lot of the media will just categorically dismiss that person in their account. But I believe that we should consider Ryan's account, Greg's account, Craig's account, Alana's account, put it all together and draw our own conclusions. So I'm very excited that we will have the first of his incredibly interesting interview coming up shortly. And I have one more thing I'd like to say about Farah and about the somewhat unusual, serious tone of this episode of Reimagine That. This podcast, kind of like Farah herself, has for the most part been light and fun and hopefully somewhat enlightening and entertaining. But like Retroality.tv and like my Three's Company book and my other projects, at times this podcast will be serious and like Farah herself, unafraid to go behind and beyond the headlines and tackle controversial subject matter. She certainly did it in The Burning Bed and Extremities and her other issue-oriented TV movies and features where she really brought to the forefront, Farah did, issues like domestic abuse, rape, all of these violence against women, incredibly important issues, as she did what it's like to battle cancer and fight so hard for your life and want to live so much that you take multiple trips to Germany to get alternative treatment not available in the United States so that you can live and help your son and continue to inspire others. Even though Farah passed away June 25th, 2009, her spirit lives on, and I feel like she would want the truth out there about her final days, her final years, the people closest to her. So it's my intention to present this with an open mind and realize that Farah would also put certain aspects of her private life out there for us to examine. She was notoriously private until the mid-90s when she did a couple of Playboy spreads and a Playboy video, and she began to share aspects of herself and her sexuality, Uh, but she always kept Redmond out of the scene. So it makes me really wonder what Farrah would think about Ryan's book and some of the revelations or the assertions in Ryan's book. Ryan's put it out there, it's in the public sphere, and this is one very strong response response to that by someone else who knew and loved Farah. And before we join Greg Lott, I would like to give a shout out about two new books about some less publicized, but in their own rights, compelling stories about some magical elements of showbiz. Uh, The first one is The Day the Stars Stood Still by my friend and now two-time author Suzanne Sumner Ferry. Check out her website at suzanneferry.blogspot.com. That's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-F-E-R-R-Y 
www.blogspot.com. The Day the Stars Stood Still, which has just been released, great title by the way, is a memoir about the career of Logan Fleming. He was a top wax artist and creative director of Movieland Wax Museum and the Palace of Living Art in Buena Park. Logan passed away recently, but Suzanne worked with him for years to bring his story, really a fascinating story with all sorts of fun and interesting interesting anecdotes about stars from Hollywood's golden age, ranging from Mae West to stars from Star Trek. It's a great, great book, and check it out. And if you happen to be or know someone who will be in the Long Beach area on Friday, June 1st, from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Expo Art Center in the Back Room Theater in Long Beach, Suzanne will be hosting a book signing at a special event. And it's my understanding that there will be a special wax figure there and that somebody filming a documentary about the Movie Land Wax Museum will be there. So hopefully, they interview Suzanne. This brings a lot of fanfare to her efforts and to the memory of Logan Fleming. It's a great book. Check it out. And I have one more book I want to mention, The Persian Room Presents by Patty Farmer. This is the first ever oral history of The Persian Room, which for those of you who don't know, was New York's premier cabaret for four decades. Patty has done a splendid job with this book, telling the story of this historical, magical New York night spot through the memories and the perspectives of many of the late 20th century celebrities who breathed life into that place and who helped give it its life. She interviews Andy Williams, Polly Bergen, Diane Carroll of Dynasty for UTV viewers, Connie Stevens, Patty Page, Michelle Lee of Knott's Landing, Lainey Kazan, and even Jack Jones, who sang The Love Boat. I mean, is there any other reason to go buy this book other than, hello, Jack Jones? But in all seriousness, there are many reasons to buy this book, and these celebrity interviews are among them. Patty has done a sensational job bringing the elegance of this story to the printed page. And if you want to meet her, she's doing an event on June 27th at the Martin Luther King Jr. Auditorium at the Santa Monica Public Library. She will be speaking. I understand there may be celebrity guests there, people she's interviewed for the book, and then she will do a signing afterwards. So if you're in Southern California, get out there, meet Patty, meet Suzanne, and support these up-and-coming talented authors who are preserving such rich, important people and places in showbiz history with these very heartfelt, spirited books. And now let's turn our attention to a man who has really an eye-opening tale, and this is part of his story. We will actually be presenting this in three parts. Greg Lott. He knew Farah for 44 years, from their college years on up to the end. We've seen photos of Greg and Farah together. We've seen the love letters that Farah sent Greg in her final years. There's so much more to this picture than we know and that the American media is putting out there. Google Greg to find out more, to see what else he's said about the subject. But I'm telling you, he really pretty much tells all, and he talks about some really controversial, newsworthy material in this interview, parts 1, 2, and 3, that will air through mid to late June in connection with the third anniversary of Farrah's passing. Uh, But this is really in honor of Farrah getting to the truth. America loved her. She was an icon. But to Greg Lott, she was a dear friend and a lover. And now let's find out the Farrah that Greg Lott knew. 
Hi there, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you so much for joining us here. Really intrigued by, you know, your relationship with Farah through the years. I, you know, saw a little bit from you two or three years ago after Farah passed, which is so shocking to believe it's been almost three years. And you had famously confronted Ryan O'Neill in the street. And uh, but we haven't heard much from you for a while. So why are you coming? Well, I was, re- I was real disappointed. I thought he'd be taller. <laughs> he's taller on camera. <laughs> and he's too short. <laughs> kind of short and fat, you know. <laughs> Uh, a departure from the uh, the love story days, I guess. Um, I guess. Well, that was the first time you met Ryan, and, and I guess the only time, right? That's correct. And now you're coming forward, you're really sort of breaking your silence about a lot of things. And what's prompting that, Greg? Well, it's not that I'm breaking my silence. I, I mean, I've, I've told this story before. It's just mm-hmm. that nobody's listened to it. And I don't know and why. Now that, he's, now that he's written this book, it's just made me furious because yeah. I feel like he's portrayed her in a negative light, mm-hmm. and uh, that's not at all who she was. And, mm-hmm. and also, I'm going to set the record straight once and for all that after 1996, he was no longer in her life except with a troubled child. Really? That goes contrary to popular opinion or perception. And I read Ryan's new book, Both of Us, and he certainly makes it seem like they had this on-again, off-again thing that was only punctuated by a few years, maybe in the late 90s. Well, they did They did have an on-again, off-again thing until the end of 1996. Ah. It was all for good, and uh, I came back into her life in 1998. Mm-hmm. He didn't know that, and so he's perpetuated this myth, and I was with her until April the 8th, 2009, and he turned the telephones off in her apartment. Wow. And that was right after she came back from her last treatment in, in Germany for cancer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And at that point, it's my understanding that you, uh, her production partner, business partner, Craig Nevius, Kate Jackson, that there were a few people close to Ferret that were just cut off, couldn't see her, couldn't speak to her, and didn't get to then, you know, for the rest of her three months on this earth, or two and a half months. Yeah, and then then some of us were barred from the funeral, you know? That is amazing. (sighs) Well, let's just, there's so much here to cover. You go back to the 60s with Farah, right? You guys met in college? We met in 1965 at the University of Texas. And you guys were college sweethearts. And tell us a bit about that so we can kind of get an idea of your history with Farah. Because each decade you were in her life and you sort of had a, an on-again, off-again relationship with her, didn't you? Absolutely, for 44 years. And yeah. we met in 1965 and we were together until about uh, 1972, and I was arrested for uh, marijuana in the state of New York and went to the penitentiary for a year. Mm -hmm. And then we got back together in, I think it was 1976 or 77, whenever she was in uh, Acapulco shooting uh, Sunburn. Oh, uh uh-huh. Three of my friends and I drove down there and stayed six weeks, and she was separated from Lee Majors at the time. and. Mm -hmm. uh, late 70s. And then I saw her until around oh, 1982 uh, when I got arrested again for a cocaine charge. So yeah. uh, the, the times that, that we were apart were because I did stupid things. And this was 30, 40 years ago, your, yeah. your arrest. I mean, we right. have been on both sides of the equation with addiction. In the last 30 years, you've had experience in terms of recovery. and Yeah, I've been uh, in recovery since 1987, mm-hmm. June 25th, 1987. And wow. I've worked in the alcoholism field. I've worked at Charter Plains Hospital in Lubbock, and, uh, and I worked in a private prison south of Austin, Texas, um, that was a model for the prison system in Texas. And uh, we set that up, and then we set up a halfway house program, and I, I was uh, instrumental in setting up all of those. And I worked for the governor and the lieutenant governor at that time. And, wow. And so, that you know, I, I look at that as just, stupid mistakes and uh, mm-hmm. you know i've paid my price and 
I'll be sober this summer, uh, 25 years. Wow. And you mentioned June 25th, which ironically is the day we lost Farah in 2009. That's weird. Yeah, Farah had a wonderful sense of humor. I figured that, <laughs> you know, just in case I might forget, she's going to die on a day that I won't ever forget, you know? Wow. Uh, she's up in heaven laughing about that, but uh, <laughs> and that's the way she was, you know? Well, she had a very interesting personality that was certainly in anything but one-dimensional, certainly anything but those glimpses people may have seen on Charlie's Angels or Letterman, and you knew her perhaps better than anyone else, uh, and certainly the longest in terms of the romantic figures in her life. When you read this book of Ryan's, what was your reaction? I mean, what are some of the major issues or discrepancies you see there? Well, you take the first story of the book, and uh, Mm -hmm. the story, the truth of that, is that Farah and Ryan were in uh, Lake Tahoe with her childhood friend from the third grade the Catholic school, Karen Cox, Mm -hmm. her boyfriend, and they were going from Tahoe to Reno for the grand opening of Karen's father's casino that he had bought. Mm -hmm. And Farrah was, you know, very famous, and she made personal appearances, and she got paid for it, and that's where they were going. had nothing to do with going to a church to get married. To Ryan (laughs) O'Neill. Yeah. And also, they ran out of gas. Uh-huh. It didn't have anything to do with the flat tire. <laughs> oh. so, I don't know why you can't just tell the truth. Wow. It's kind of all downhill after that. And they say the truth is stranger than fiction, and certainly things that have been in the press the last 30 years, even the last few years about Ryan O'Neill, the truth is dramatic enough. And you said that, of course, she never married Ryan, but really... What happened in 1996 that made them separate? Did they separate at the beginning of 97 or the end of 96? I think the press release was somewhere around February the 24th of 1997. Mm -hmm. I don't know when, I don't know the date of the incident that finally, where he mentions in his book and uh, on the reality show that he did with his daughter, that Farrah came down to the beach and he was in bed with some other woman. Mm -hmm. And I think along with their opposites about parents and Redmond, uh, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And uh, that was the end of their relationship, period. And when you got back in touch with Farrah in 98, and from there on, she filled you in on... Well, actually, what happened was... She called me through her sister, Diana, who I was always very close to. She named one of her sons after me. Mm. She called me, and she wanted my advice because she was doing a pre-sentence report with a probation officer in the trial with James Orr when James Orr beat her. Oh, God, yeah. And so we started talking then, and then... I separated from my wife in September of uh, 1998, and we started talking seriously on the phone, and October the 16th, I went out to California, and and we got back together. And we were together, like I said, until April the 8th, Mm -hmm. when I talked to her the night before she went home from St. John's Hospital after coming back from Germany, and I never talked to her again. Now, I've got phone records, Chris, for 10 years of talking to this woman every day, sometimes twice a day, and I've got love letters, and I can't get anybody to understand that Ryan O'Neill was not in her life, except with a troubled child. You know, looking back, there are so many different points where their relationship seemed to go south, and even Ryan admits it really got bad when they did this sitcom Good Sports in 1991. But then we would see Ryan and Farah occasionally, like in the reality show, there was an episode where they were sort of dancing, and it would seem romancing, and then we saw him again in the documentary Farah's Story, which is sort of a whole other story. I've interviewed Craig Nevius about Ryan's takeover of that project. But how come we would occasionally see Ryan and Farrah together seeming to be flirting or having something other than just co-parenting? Well, one reason that you would is because he had complete control over her son. Mm -hmm. He lived with him at the beach, and the way she placated and did brinksmanship with Ryan was that she would give him his photo op. And that made him happy. Then he would let her have access to her son. And the Chasing Fair episode, I asked her about that, and she said to me, would you have rather been in it? And I said, no. (laughs) You weren't for the Hollywood scene then. No. And, you know, that's 
you know, what made his uh, world go around. So more power to him. And so this son that they shared was really the only linchpin holding them together. Uh, when they separated in 96, he then took Redmond. What was the dynamic then in terms of Farrah needing to placate Ryan to have her son in her life? Well, actually, when he was 12, and I believe it was uh, 1997, he was in a private school, and her sister was looking after him, picking him up and taking him to school, taking Redmond to school, and Farrah was on location, I think, doing the substitute wife, and she got a phone call, and uh, Redmond wasn't at school when Diane went to pick him up. Oh, wow. So... As far as I know, from talking to Farrah in California, when you're 12 years old, you can decide who, which parent you want to live with. And since they weren't married, there was no custody, and he chose to go live at the beach uh, uh-huh. for all the obvious reasons, you know. Mm-hmm. And Farrah was a disciplinarian, and uh, there were rules in her house, and there were no drugs, and there certainly weren't uh, and girls. And Ryan has sort of always had that reputation of being, a, I guess, a, a playboy, although he says in the book he stopped doing that when he met Farah, and he indicates in the book that he thought that Farah was unfaithful to him first with James Orr when she was working on his movie, was it Man of the House in 1994? Mm-hmm. Well, he seems to conveniently blame other people for everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm talking about this book is because the things that he says about her are not true. That's not true. She had already dismissed him in the press mm-hmm. before she started going out with James Orr. She might have had four dates with James Orr before he beat her up. Mm-hmm. And, and so... You know, you can call it whatever you want to, but Ryan O'Neill's a liar. Well, there has certainly been different accounts than Ryan's in the press. Not only Craig in terms of the documentary, but his own children, the two oldest children, or at least his two children with Joanna Moore, Tatum and Griffin, have both contradicted things Ryan has said. You mentioned Ryan blaming, and that was something that struck me when I read the book. There was sort of like this occasional, I guess, effort on his part to seem to take some responsibility. Like he would say, like Joanna Moore, their mother, and I made some dreadful mistakes parenting. Uh, And he would cop to things like emotional insecurity. But then when it got right down to it, he really blamed Joanna for Tatum and Griffin's addictions, saying that they were hardwired. And then for Redmond, he blames Griffin, who was living with him in Malibu. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. (laughs) You were the parent. Why was Griffin in that house if he was still a bad influence? So I found that was pretty striking about responsibility. Well, you know, he has a drug conviction for methamphetamine. So uh, Mm -hmm. that ought to tell you what's going on. You know, it's his house. He's responsible. And that was in, like, September of 2008 when he and uh, Redmond were both arrested. Right. What did Farrah make of that whole episode? Well, she called me. She'd taken Redmond down to the beach because he had a court date or something. And after the National Enquirer story, she told both of them if there were any more incidences, they would have to deal with the lawyers. They would have to deal with the judges. They'd have to go to court. That she was not going to deal with it anymore. She was too sick and she was tired of it. And so she was going to drop Redmond off. And she'd had a chemo session that day and she was sick. She stayed over in the spare bedroom. And the sheriff's, nine sheriff's guys came at 7 o'clock in the morning and took them away. Wow. And she called me about noon and told me the story. And, uh, you know, come to find out, Ryan's trying to tell them that it's not his drugs that they were Redmond. Yeah. And so, you know, that all, Redmond's on probation at the time. He could have gone to penitentiary over that. Oh, my gosh. Well, Tatum and I believe Griffin both have alleged that Ryan introduced them to drugs when they were young. And Ryan, I believe, denies that categorically in the book but you look at it and you have three children who are in serious trouble with serious drugs we're not just talking alcohol and marijuana we're talking hardcore drugs and then he has this fourth kid patrick who had a different mother lee taylor young i believe and we don't hear much from patrick but we did recently he sort of came to ryan's defense in an essay for the Huffington Post saying, leave my dad alone, I know my dad, my dad's my hero. But then he also says that he really didn't live with Ryan, maybe he moved in with Ryan and Farrah when he was in high school. What do you make of 
Patrick O'Neill's all of a sudden sort of defense of Ryan. Oh, it's just like everything that's going on right now. You know, it's just public relations for this book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's in a tremendous fight with the University of Texas over the Warhol painting. And uh, yes, so, you know, that's set for trial on November 27th. And uh, I wasn't going to say anything as long as this book was just going to be a love story, whatever else he was going to fabricate. But the tone of this and the ugliness of the way he talks about her is just like like he talked about her in the Vanity Fair article, and I can't take it anymore. Yeah. That's not the person that she was. She was a wonderful mother, you know. She just didn't want people around that were doing drugs in front of her son, and that was one of the parenting problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, Farrell always had her own home, and she had her own uh, money, and she had her own rules. And if you didn't abide by them, you didn't get to go to her house. Whether you were fun or Ryan O'Neill or anybody else. And Farrah, I, I think this is an important thing to mention here. Because sometimes people, I think, seem a little confused by who was Farrah. Because there are times that we would see her in public, like on the Letterman show, where she seemed a bit flighty or maybe incoherent. And then there were other times where she was clearly a take charge, in control businesswoman who didn't sign her contract on Charlie's Angels because they weren't giving her a merchandising deal that she felt was fair. I mean, that was in 1976. So to think that she wouldn't be together in the 90s or 2000s when her son needed her, it, that's kind of a stretch for people. Well, you know, in the 60s, I tried to get her to smoke pot and, and do acid and stuff like that, and she wasn't interested in it then. It's kind of crazy to think all of a sudden when she turned 50, she's just going to turn into a drug addict? Right. I don't think so. She didn't even drink. It didn't make any sense to people who grew up watching her, this athlete, this sort of specimen of health. Well, a little bit of background uh, of the two weeks before the Letterman show. Yeah. She was in the process of editing. She had a final cut in all of me video that was going to be on pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. And she was under the gun because if she didn't make a certain deadline, then they'd take it away from her. Playboy would take it away from her and edit themselves because they were going with that hard day. So mm -hmm. along with that, however many 16-hour days in the editing day, yeah. that was also the period where Redmond went to live with his father. Now, uh. the phones were turned off, and she had no access to her child, and she was sick, and she got run down, and so by the time she got to New York, there were 3,000 people waiting outside the theater, yeah. 1,500 college boys inside screaming her name, mm -hmm. and you didn't hear any of this on the audio because, you know, they edited it, but David lost complete control of that scene, and and she just went into the ditzy blonde that she used to do right. with Johnny Carson to protect herself because she saw that he was going to be uh, ugly to her wow. about the nudity, whether she was she had pain on or not. Uh -huh. And I don't know, you know, there were stories had been planted in the tabloids back in California. That uh -huh. She was using drugs and she was thin and it just caught on and people turned on her. I don't think that people liked her nudity. Uh -huh. You know, she had a European view. Of, of the female form because she was an artist. Right. She didn't see anything wrong with it. But, you know, from then on, uh, you know, she, she caught hell. Do you know maybe who, or did she have suspicions about who was planting well, these Griffin stories? Well, her towards the last year of her life. You know, he confided in her and told her that he was planting stories in the globe. Oh, wow. And, and being compensated for it. And it was all part of O'Neill's, uh, you know, trying to shine the light off of their problems, you know? Wow. So Ryan had Redmond in at least the first part of 97 when they separated. He never lived with his mother from the time he was 12 years old, you know, until she died. He lived at the beach with his father. And that was really when his behavioral problems spiraled out of control at that age. Well, because I had background in uh, treatment, drug and alcohol treatment, I helped her put him in 14 different facilities. Between, like, 19, I want to say 1998 or 1999 when he first went to Casa by the Sea mm -hmm. and uh, until, you know, the last one, which, to my knowledge, he never finished a semester of school nor any 
program from 12 years old until, you know, whatever it is now. Wow. And Farah would go to various lengths to try to help him. Well, she participated in all of the programs that each one of these treatment facilities wanted the parents to be involved in, and Ryan never participated, and he always went and rescued him. Rescued Redmond from the treatment? Yeah, he never finished any of them. Oh my gosh. So this is what she was going through during this whole Letterman Playboy fiasco. Absolutely. People don't know that. In Ryan's book, he portrays Farah as she reaches 50 as being menopausal, temperamental, prone to fits of rage and deep insecurity about her looks. Well, that's interesting, you know, because those two Playboys in 1995 and 1997 sold more copies than any other Playboy issues in the history of Playboy magazine. Yeah. And when I met her again in 1998, of course, she was an incredible athlete. And it's my understanding that some women, you know, they go through menopause late in life. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see, Farrell would have been, uh, she'd been 51 then, and she was still had a menstrual cycle. And she was very, very sensual and sexual. And I don't know what he's talking about. I didn't find her to be, first of all, I didn't ever see any menopause. And second of all, I didn't see her depressed. And my God, how could you look any better? Right. I, I mean, she was so, a knockout. So she was still the most loving, the most caring, the most thoughtful, the sweetest person I have ever known in my life. Another sidebar to that, my mother hadn't seen her in 20 years, and she had become the most famous woman in the world. She was wealthy, and she met my mother again when she had to have eye surgery in Houston, and my mother said, well, my God, you haven't changed a bit. Oh, wow. And my mother hadn't seen her since college. The same Texas girl. Yeah, the same girl from Corpus Christi. She never changed. Despite the James Orr stuff, the Ryan O'Neill right. stuff. I mean, she was tough. Her dad would tell you, man, she was tough. And she was smart, and she ran her own show. Nobody told her what to do. I mean, people tried to. They didn't last long. Uh-huh. And I'm really grateful to Ryan and Lee both because, you know, they blew it gave me another chance. Well, they both seem to have a reputation for being rather controlling. Is that your understanding that they both were... They tried. They tried. They tried, and I mean, I have to say that, you know, Lee's shown more class over the years, but you mm-hmm. got to also know that Farrah didn't speak to him for 25 years. So you take Redmond out of the equation, then there's no Ryan O'Neill. And what do you think... Because we've seen Ryan in interviews, and he seems very sad about Ferris passing, and he seems very loving. But then if you do read the book, which I don't think most people in the media who have interviewed him have, there are these references that are less than flattering, and there is a tendency to put a lot of responsibility on Farah for their marriage going south and for maybe Redmond. What do you think is motivating Ryan to be less than loving well, in, in this book? Of all the incidents that I know of, and there's many, 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 many over the 11 years we were together, I think he despised her. I think he hated her guts. I think really? he was as ugly you could ever be to a person that you had been with. And uh, he was terribly hateful to her all the way through to the very end. Wow. That is certainly not something he's portrayed in the book. And, I, you know, there, I kept waiting for the page or the chapter in the book where he addresses his volatility and his history of being physical and... But he really doesn't. Everything is sort of couched in, you know, my kids provoked me or Farah provoked me. And then there was an incident with Farah leaving extremities when she was doing the play in New York. Do you know anything about that? Well, the story was is that, you know, she broke her wrist on stage. The truth of the matter is they got in an argument. He's a bully. You know, he pushes Mm -hmm. people around. And, uh... She defended herself. She put her hands up in a boxing stance because she'll fight you. And he hit her in the wrist and broke her wrist. And that's why she left extremity. Wow. So here was this woman who had just gotten all these raves in the burning bed and was doing extremities, would do the movie later, playing this woman that had been victimized, battered. And then this happened to her with James Orr. And to some degree, at least on this one occasion, there was violence with Ryan. Do you think by the time you got back in touch with Farah in 98 that she had had a transformation and realized that 
she was attracted to this kind of a guy and she wasn't going to be doing that anymore? I mean, do you think there well, was a... Well, I'll tell you, there's another interesting story. When I got there in 98, she had 14 stitches in the web of her left hand. Mm. You know, the little web between your thumb and your index finger? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She had 14 stitches in there where it was just torn all the way down. Yikes. You know, it was unbelievable. And so... I asked her what happened, and uh, she'd been introduced to a tennis pro over at the Van Patten's house, where she always played tennis with uh, Nils and... uh, Vince. uh, (laughs) Vince, okay? Because she was real close to them. They had a normal family outside of Hollywood and all that kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. and that was a safe place for her to go, and that's where she played tennis all the time. So she'd met this tennis pro, and they'd had a few dates, and then, just like her dad would always tell me, everybody that ever meets her, Greg, they want to marry her. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, yeah, well, that's not surprised you know and so once again here she is she's introduced by these people that supposedly know this guy they've been up and down the coast with him uh, all the way from del mar to wherever with these tennis tournaments and uh he ends up wanting to marry her and she says no he loses his temper she's in her little art shed out back of her house and she's trying to pull the two doors together so she can lock it because he's getting violent with her oh my god and, she tore, you know, the webbing in her hand, and uh, wow. he got freaked out and left. But so I get there on a Friday. On Monday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, here comes this guy beating on her door, going around to the back of the house where they're sliding glass doors, like he's going to break in to her house. And I, I was in the shower, so changed into sweatpants and a hood. And went and got a baseball bat out of the closet, and she said, please don't go out there. You know, it'll just turn into something terrible. Uh-huh. So apparently he saw me. I'm a pretty good size, and he saw me through the window, and he ran. Oh, my gosh. And I don't. I believe that if I hadn't been there, he would have broken into her house, and she would have been, in, you know, in another situation. Oh, my but God. But you gotta know that she's introduced to all these people by reputable people, and she's expecting, like it is here in Texas, that a man's going to be a gentleman. Now, mm-hmm. if they come up come on and they're a con man, then what are you going to do? Is it mm-hmm. your fault? You know? And, and then, uh, then, of course, a lot of women stay in relationships with the child, hoping that things will get better so the child won't be traumatized. You know? Right, right. And that's, you know, that's the story. You know, Farrah's just a human being. She's just you know, just because she was an icon didn't mean that she wasn't, you know, normal. And she had her frailties despite being an athlete and a, a strong, rather independent well, woman. Yeah, she had her frailties because she inherited some of the things from her mother, and she overcame them with her athleticism and with health, food, and vitamins and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the stress that she was under when I met her again in 1998 was just unbelievable because she had a career. She had this child. She had, you know, take care of the publicity that was going on, that was finally had turned on her. Uh And, uh, you know, she just, uh, it wore down. It must have been incredibly overwhelming to have everything amplified by the media. I remember the tabloids were always on her case. Oh, she couldn't go anywhere. We, We would go into the valley to the movies because there wasn't any paparazzi there. And we'd go over there and go to eat and stuff like that. That's why we never were photographed. But Mm -hmm. Sarah and I had both been famous in college, and we just didn't want to have that kind of relationship again in the public. And we certainly didn't want her son to use me as an excuse to continue to relapse. And he was a spy for his dad, so Mm -hmm. they just didn't know I was in her life. None of their business. So that was one of the reasons why you kept it a secret then, because of the Red, the Redman factor? Right. Uh, if you could go back with the luxury of knowing how things turned out with Redmond and such, would you have insisted that Farah move back to Texas? I mean, what would you have done well, differently if you could have? When he was 14, we tried to get him to Provo, Utah, to this program that had a, like a 98% uh, recovery rate. And in the state of California, you have to have both parents' signature on a piece of paper, and Ryan wouldn't sign it. And that was really our last opportunity to get him away to a place where he had a chance. He came to Texas one time and, you know, just turned her father upside down. He was too old to be able to help him and control him and stuff like that. But, you know, he just... uh, 
he just wanted to be a you know a druggie. It's so tragic, particularly given what would become Farah's fate at the end, and to see that her son is still battling all of these demons. You know, we haven't heard a lot from Redmond. We've certainly heard a lot from Tatum and Griffin about Ryan's influence on them. Did Farah ever tell you if Ryan ever you know maybe threatened Farah that she wouldn't see Redmond again? That kind of thing. That what kind of control he had there of Redmond? Oh, absolutely. When she had to have her father come out in 1996 to make him leave her house, and he told her going out the door that he would get back at her with this child. He knew how to do it, and he had done it before. Oh, and my God. He, made, he followed through with that. You know? Wow. Absolutely. And that was when he was like 12. Redmond was 12 yeah, years old. Redmond was 12. And, you know, he told Redmond that his mother didn't care anything about either one of them, that all she cared about was money and her career and all this kind of stuff. And it, oh, that's God. just not true. She's a great mother, and she had wonderful parenting skills because her parents were wonderful people. And she yes. was tough. He was a disciplinarian. And you're going to get up, and you're going to go to school, and you're going to learn things. You're not just going to go lay around and be a slug. Yeah. It's not going to happen with her. She was not the kind to sit around and get a pot belly. <laughs> no. Well, and not only that, but if you met her, one of, one of the reasons why she was such a dynamic and she had this aura was because she wanted everybody that she came in touch with to be the best they could be at whatever that was mm-hmm. and to inspire people to go do things, you know? Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. she was. She was an inspirational human being, you know, and I think she was put here for that reason. It wasn't just the movies. No, and, and it wasn't just the beauty. I, and uh, we certainly, like I said, people really started to get an idea of the layers of Farah with her TV movies in the 80s. Were you in touch with her at all in the 80s? No, I, you know, I got out of prison in 1985, and uh, she had Redmond that year, and... <laughs> I just didn't get in touch with her sister. Uh, you know, I just thought, I just mm-hmm. thought, well, you know, they must be happy. They've had a child, yeah. and I just kind of let it go. And then until 1993, Farah called Karen in Austin, her childhood friend, and wanted myself and my wife to come down to Corpus Christi to a battered women's shelter fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And you know, I didn't think that was a very good idea. I told my wife that we were not a very good relationship, and I tried to explain to her, you know, that when Farah and I got together that it was magic and uh, you know <laughs> if things weren't right you know, who knows what might happen you know right so she's starstruck and wanted to meet her and all this kind of stuff so anyway <laughs> we finally went and uh fair and i saw each other and we both saw that we were not happy and it just lightened the bottle again you know in 93 in 93 and then the next year, she came to Austin and did The Substitute's Wife, and we talked a little bit more, and I saw their relationship was even worse than it had been Wow! with Ryan and the child and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, by, what, 1998, um, when I separated, you know, that's when I called her and I said, life's too short, you know, what do you think? Yeah. And so I made amends to her for the times that I just disappeared in her life, because, you know, going to penitentiary after you've been a big hero like me... It's a humbling, embarrassing position, and I certainly didn't want it to reflect on her. Mm -hmm. And and she didn't deserve to have a connection with a boyfriend who was involved in in drugs at that time. Because in college, you were like a star football player. I mean, you and Farah were sort of like the homecoming king and queen in a way. Right. Well, I was a quarterback, and I was a good one, and uh, and she was one of the campus beauties, and it was the time of my life. I mean, it was wonderful. and uh, But it's always been that way. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter how long Farrah and I would be apart. When we got back together, it was just electric, you know? And it always was that way, always. And you never experienced this sort of menopausal, angry <laughs> no. woman that is depicted in Ryan's book? <laughs> no. No. Now, she had a temper like an oil field worker like her father, and she could spew some language, and she'd fight you, but it was only when, you know, somebody had done her wrong. Had really crossed her. (laughs) Yeah, if you crossed her, that was it. You know, there was no turning back. And and I don't remember anybody that ever crossed her getting a second chance. Yeah. You know, Lee's a perfect example. she, She didn't talk to him for 25 years. Until her last few months on the planet, and they just, they got back in touch via phone. Well, Craig had a project, and, and you know, he kind of pitched it to both of them, and uh, uh-huh. Farrah had, you know, she was a lot easier going, because 
you know, she had been through hell. Yeah. And uh, there yeah. wasn't any reason to keep grudges anymore. I mean, you know. Yeah. And I guess Lee has uh, made amends. I mean, I think I've read he acknowledged that he was a heavy drinker during their marriage. So to your knowledge, did he sort of take responsibility for his role in that union coming apart with Farrah? Um, I, I don't know what he did. I, you know, we didn't ever talk about what he did or what he didn't do. I, yeah. I mean, I know what drove him apart was, you know, he didn't come home. He was out with the boys. He drank too much. Yeah. You know, everybody was doing cocaine back then. I was. And, yeah. and uh, you know, she was working. And when she works, she works. She's a professional. And uh, all that crap about having dinner waiting for her, that's a bunch of crap. That's just People magazine. That it was in her contract that she had to leave Charlie's Angels by a certain time to make dinner for Lee? Yeah, that's just a crock. That's a crock. <laughs> and that's why she left the show, so she could be there to make well, him dinner? Well, she certainly didn't you know, wait for him uh, to get the phone call to get naked and get in bed. Which is what Ryan says in his book. Right. I mean, how stupid is that? And why would somebody say that? Is that not mean-spirited, or am I missing something? Because it's certainly not true. And that's the thing. It's like when Ryan has done publicity for the book, he has seemed very soft-spoken, very loving of Farrah. But if you read the book, it's sort of like this other thing. And then he has made comments that are seemingly a joke in various interviews, like when he said that he nodded Farrah's head, you know, when he asked her to Until marry. he found out in California she has to say yes. I mean, when she was ill, that he nodded her head, yes, that she would marry him. I mean, what do you make of how things ended for Ryan and Farrah? Because it would seem to the public that Ryan was there by her side and he was there in her final months and that there was this love story ending how was it really and where do you think ryan was left emotionally in terms of the way things ended with Farah? well i really don't understand why uh i was never able to talk to her again i mean we had a business together we were partners in a website Mm -hmm. i stayed there for the three months from the time when easter until she died and hoping that i would get to see her and yet you know I was put on a list where I could not contact her, and there was a power of attorney. I was told that he had power of attorney, and she didn't want to see anybody anymore, okay? But out of the 44 years that I knew her, if you were inside her family, if you were a loved one, if you were her parents, there was an unwritten rule that if there was a major situation where you needed to hear from her directly, I don't want to see you ever again, you're not allowed on the set, blah, 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 whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. If you didn't hear it from her lips, you were not to accept any of that from an assistant, from Mm -hmm. an agent, from a business manager, from nobody. From an ex-husband or an (laughs) ex-lover? Exactly, especially not him. Yeah. And I didn't accept that, and and I'm still not going to accept it. And uh, you've interviewed Craig. You know what happened. Yes. I am still, to this day, stunned. She had formed a a business with him also. They were... Just like me. Just like you. And... But yet, she would let herself be shown on camera for the documentary looking so ravaged, but she didn't want the two of you or Kate Jackson to see her when she came back to Germany. It doesn't make sense. And the, really, well, there was only a small group of people that had access to her at that point. Farrah had three telephone lines. She had a main line. Well, actually, there was four ways you could get her. There was a phone that went directly from the desk downstairs in her condo to the apartment, okay? Uh And she had a line one, which was for the public, for the agents, for her career. Then she had a private line that only her parents and me had and her son. And then she had a third line, which was a fax line, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, a cell phone, I'm sorry. And, And she had a fax line as well. So when all of those forms of communication were stopped, now you gotta know, She's got a son that's shooting heroin. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. as a mother, you don't ever turn your telephones off. Right. Okay? And, and I never knew her in her entire life to not talk to her father every morning of her 60 years. Wow. And he was in his 90s at that point, but he couldn't come back to see her, but he was still very alert mentally. Well, he could certainly talk to her over the phone, which didn't happen. You know, I called him and wanted to know what to do, and then he finally asked me to go out there and find out what was wrong. Oh, my God. Which is what I did, and uh, I told him what was wrong, and, and he didn't believe me. 
he was not as well as I had been led to believe, you know. Uh-huh. I've since talked to Pharaoh's stepmother, his wife that he married after her mother died, and, uh, you know, he was real sick. He was incapable of doing anything wow. about what was going on. But once the power of attorney was given to Bernie Francis, there was nothing anybody could do anyway. And for people who don't know, Bernie Francis is the trustee of her estate, and he's also Ryan's business manager? Yeah, for over 30 years. And he was Pharaoh's, you know, for a long time until they separated, and she got other representation, and then she ended up back with Bernie. But you've got to understand that Pharaoh signed her own check and she looked over everything that went through her life mm-hmm. she didn't just have somebody who had carte blanche to manage her money mm-hmm. i mean she gave bernie money from time to time that he invested in real estate syndicates and stuff like that but because of his long-term relationship those last three years of her life she would never entrust bernie francis or ryan o'neill with her life with her life savings, with her estate, with anything, because after the 91 incident with good sports, she told Ryan that she would never, ever do business with him again. We will hear that story about Farah and Ryan's tumultuous experience on the comedy Good Sports and how that was really, according to Greg, the beginning of the end of their storied relationship. We will also hear Greg sound off on the Farrah Fawcett Foundation and the California State Attorney General's Office investigation into that organization, as well as the University of Texas lawsuit against Ryan O'Neill. And we'll hear many more stories from Greg about his long, interesting relationship with Farah. So check back in early June for that. And thank you, Greg, once again for this fascinating interview. From TV's favorite angel to another kind of ethereal, otherworldly vision altogether, it's time for another enlightening Dreamweaver segment with our resident dream interpreter, Yvonne Reba. Find out more about Yvonne by visiting her website, YvonneReba.com. That's Y-V-O-N-N-E-R-Y-B-A.com. And this week, inspired by an upcoming Reimagine That segment that we will be premiering in late spring, early summer, titled Reality Reimagined, about everyday people going after their dreams by reinventing their lives at certain crossroads, Yvonne analyzes a recurring dream of mine that seemed to rerun with increasing frequency as I approached 40, which I did recently, and especially as I embarked on new avenues in life around age 35, give or take a year, this dream recurred with more and more frequency from that point on, and it harked back to another pivotal point in my life as I reached another milestone of age 20 when I was in college. So, you know, we all have our own Groundhog Day, and this dream sort of epitomized that for me. So stick with us, listen to Yvonne, see what you may be able to take and apply to your own life if you have your own recurring dream, particularly one that sort of retro and goes back to a different point in your life, which may seem irrelevant, but maybe it's really telling you that these are recurring issues in your life that you need to pay attention to in order to sort of master the exam of life. So let's Let us check in once again with Yvonne. So hi again, Yvonne. Hi, Chris. Great to chat with you again, and I hope all is well for you. Yes, it is. It's a beautiful day here as well. Absolutely. Beautiful spring day. Flowers are out all over. It's just wonderful. Love it. It's a rebirth. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm kind of going through a rebirth of sorts, and I know that many of our listeners do, particularly, you know, as you reach a new decade in your life, and I'm getting ready to leave my 30s, which is sort of crazy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But I thought, you know, I'm starting a segment on this show called Reality Reimagined, and I 
I started thinking about how I've reimagined my reality, and a recurring dream that I've had came to mind, and I shared that with you, and I can't wait to hear your analysis of it. But Mm. just to sort of say, you know, it focuses on a period of my life about 20 years ago, just as I was getting ready to turn 20 and become, quote, an adult in the real world. And Mm -hmm. without giving away too much right now, it feels like those insecurities and those issues from that time relative particularly to my work uh, are recurring again. In the last seven years, I've gone off on my own, left my day job, which I had reached a certain level of success in, to become an independent professional. So in the last few months and years in particular, this dream has recurred as I've taken on more and more new projects. And so I would love to see what you think about it and what the heck can I do to get this dream to stop? It's sort of like my own Groundhog Day. How do I change this? (laughs) Yes, Groundhog Day. That's a a good one. That's a great movie. You go over and over the same thing, trying to change it. Yes, and you can't. Well, The first part is just becoming cognizant that this is recurring and then what can I do to stop this rerun? So that's, we've talked about lucid dreaming. Is Can you kind of go through my dream and then give me a little advice? Absolutely, right. Oh, wonderful. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just let me set it up. So I've got a page here where you wrote me your dream. And then in between, I had written what I thought about each piece. Yes. So I'm going to read out what you said, then I'll let everybody know it's my words coming through. Perfect. Okay, so Chris wrote two or three times a year for the last several years years, I dream that I am back in college circa 1992, preparing or forgetting to prepare to put out the first issue of the student newspaper. I was editor-in-chief of the Collegium during my junior year, and frequently the dream feels rooted in that space in time. Though usually I feel my present age, my 30s, in this recurring dream, my peers and my faculty advisor are the age they were 20 years ago. Yes. So, that's the beginning, and I wrote back to you. Well, recurring dreams mean that is something you have not learned or dealt with yet. Once you get the message and you understand, the dream will stop. Or the dream may change as you approach the next problem in your life, (laughs) which we always have. (laughs) Yeah, issue two. That's right. And the only people who don't have any problems are in the cemetery. So we know that we're all going to have problems. (laughs) Right, right. right. (laughs) Okay, so... This is me going on. Here you forget to prepare for an important responsibility. Since you go back in the dream to college, it seems that your subconscious equates the thing you have a problem with as something similar to going to college. Yes. And this is a new level of learning. Because as an adult, this is the whole new way of doing things. And we know that. You're in high school. There's one set of ways of doing things. And you go to university and, boy, oh, is that a surprise. Right. You're thrown in with a lot of people who are all different from different different parts of the country or world, Absolutely. different ways of doing things. Yeah, you have to learn a whole new staff, a new faculty, mm-hmm. and they're all different. And, mm-hmm. and they have to learn you, too. They have to find out what makes you tick. So it yep. is a complete new life. A definite fish out of water. Fish out of water, you're right. And uh, before, you were a fish in a small pond, a big fish. <laughs> and then you get into a huge, big lake, yeah. and you find there's a whole lot of weird fish flying around or swimming around in this thing, and you've got to get used to it. Yes, absolutely. So that, that's kind of how, that's what dreams about universities, colleges, and so on mean. It means you've reached a higher level of learning now, a mm. new experience where you're called upon to go deeper, to be in greater depth, as you're going to use this thing about swimming around in ponds and lakes and things. <laughs> you're going into it. <laughs> deeper level of understanding what you are about in your life. What is your calling yes. and your vacation? What am I supposed to be doing? And here I've forgotten to do something that's incredibly important. I didn't even think about it, yeah. right? That's yeah. a panic button. Yes. Panic, 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 right. Absolutely. Well, other people have dreams about going on stage and not learning the script or forgetting their lines and that kind of thing. Right. But you don't have to be an actor to have that dream. Because I think I've told you I've had that kind of dream. Yes. But 
The thing is, in your dream, that you realize you haven't done whatever it was. At least you didn't even know, perhaps, that you were supposed to do it. Right. <laughs> I wrote that here you have to use a new discipline. It's self-discipline. It's focus. It's learning at a higher level. Whatever you are concerned about in your real life, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. it's a higher level of learning than you have done before. Mm -hmm. Now, I have known you for quite a few years. Yeah. And I know that you have grown into new places yep. continually. Every so often, you decide to expand your experience and move into something new. Yes. And you add to what you've done and so on and so on. And every time, probably that's when you're having these dreams. Yes. It's like, wait a minute, have I taken on something I can't handle? Right. I I'm worried. Right. Yeah, in the dream, there's just this sort of feeling of dread and disorientation. And it's sort of like the classic dream where you show up in class to take the test and you didn't study. But yeah. this is really like a super magnified version of that with me in that specific setting, which was so transformative for me back then, going from the small pond to the big pond. And it feels like that's sort of an analogy for my life in my 30s, mm -hmm. particularly the mm -hmm. last maybe five to seven years. So yeah. it's sort of like, oh my God, why do I keep forgetting to put this issue to bed, so to speak? Right. And how do I put it to bed? So it's kind of crazy. Yeah, that's right. Now, in the dream you wrote, it's usually the first week of classes. Mm -hmm. And I walk into the newsroom to realize I forgot to plan and publish the first issue, which in reality would have taken several days or weeks to put together. Yes. In the dream, I can't believe that I haven't even begun to plan the first issue. <laughs> All of the insecurities, and then you had written, or issues, yes. I felt at the time in my life, well, there's a good play on words. Yes. I was, at that time, a 19 or 20-year-old socially awkward kid who went from being an extracurricular overachiever and valedictorian of his small town high school to being an overextended young adult struggling to balance honors classes with working 60-plus hours a week at a metropolitan private university full of confident academic types. Yeah. And they all came flooding back in this dream. Yes. Right. Now, let me straighten you out here. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Well, you have this dream when you have a lot of stress yeah. in your life. So all this stress that you work through and being an artist, and I'm, you're in that category, right? The creative, artistic person, right? Whatever it is, actor, writer, you know, musician, whatever. You're all in that place where you have to face rejection. Yes. You're on your own, coming up with your own stuff, your own ideas, and trying it out on people and seeing if it'll work. Yes. You have to face rejection many, many times. And it's very stressful. Yes. And this scenario that we are going through here is a habit now with you. Mm -hmm. It's a habit. Now, it's, you're too hard on yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. You imagine in the dream that everybody else, and you probably thought it at the time, everybody else in that place was very confident, okay? Mm -hmm. They all knew stuff you didn't know. Because I know how that felt, because I had that when I went to university many years ago in England. And the thing is, they didn't. They may look as if they knew more. Right. <laughs> and they put on a face and learned how to do that. Sure. But they didn't, right? Yeah. Some of them were just as nervous and scared as you were. Yeah. But you can do, and I know you can, you have learned how to do this thing, and you can do it, whatever it is, you can do it. Now, artists are notorious for having lack of confidence in themselves. Yes. Okay? But in this dream... And you say, sometimes I distinctly feel that I've returned to college in my mid to late 30s to repeat a student task that I long ago mastered, but that apparently I couldn't pull off in the real world. Yes. This dream seems to have intensified in the last few years since I left my steady day job as a magazine art director to go out on a limb as a freelance writer and creative new media entrepreneur. Yes. That's the nature of an artist. Mm -hmm. An artist doesn't stay safe. An artist goes out on a limb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. An artist has to be true to himself and herself. Mm -hmm. They have to prove themselves. And there's only one thing, and that Shakespeare said, to be true to yourself. Okay, that's what it's about. Right. Now, I remember when I was reading that, and I wrote to you, how artists are notorious for the lack of confidence they have in themselves, uh -huh. even after they've proved it over and over. But Sir Lawrence Olivia, I remember reading this many years ago, uh -huh. he had stage fright before he went on stage, years after he became the number one stage actor of his time. Really? I didn't know that. 
Yes, he nearly threw up every time. And <laughs> well, Sir he Lawrence. The habit, you see. Yeah, he was shaking and he nearly threw up and then he would step on the stage, the door disappeared and he was fine. Wow. Okay, well that's kind of comforting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. You see, he got in the habit of winding himself up. Yes. And that's how I'm going to put it. You wind yourself up to get to the place where you want to be. So you have to screw yourself to the point, as it were. And I mean that like, you know, turning the nail or whatever. Right. Because you are... Feeling that's the only way you're going to get through it. Yes. I've got to make myself really suffer for my art. I have got to be anxious and sort of not expect it to happen and say if rejection comes, I'll be ready for it. Yes. Okay? Well, you don't need to do that. You do not need to do it. That's good to know. And I guess I wasn't even really conscious that I was still doing that. But I guess that's one thing that your subconscious does is it sort of lets you know that, no, this is still an issue issue for you deep down so let's address it and can it can be addressed within the dream yes it can you know we did the lucid dreaming thing you mentioned yes some time ago you can program yourself and so can anybody mm-hmm. anybody can do this and i have done it right and if i can do it anybody can do it right mm-hmm. you can say beforehand i am going to stop this the next time that dream comes up i am going to have help now it might be you yourself suddenly produce out of your back pocket a CD with the issue that you, the yeah. first week's issue or something that you were going to do. Nice. You can say, miracle, you know, here it is. Or you could wave <laughs> a wand over the thing and they all appear. Yeah. Or you could have Superman show up or whatever you want. Yes. You can have it any way you like. Anything is possible in dreams. Absolutely, in a dream. And that will get you through this. And it's all about just getting into a root and into a habit of worrying, you know. Now, I had a, a wonderful mother-in-law when I was first married many years ago. She was a real wonderful wonderful woman in many ways she was loving kind she was really great however she worried that woman could worry about anything Uh and she wasn't really she didn't feel like she was doing her duty unless she was worrying about something yes 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 she got into the habit of oh if i don't worry you know the sky will fall in or something like that you know (laughs) my mom's like that i worry about you getting home safely you know Mm -hmm. so she worried it meant i would get home safely Right, and so on. And so you get into the habit, you see. Now, you've got to stop that. You've got to yeah. say, look, I get it. It'll be great. I can do it. Of course I can. Yes. I'm not doing this to fail. I'm doing this to succeed. I am confident in myself, and my spiritual core is there to help me. That, we've talked about this before, but that's what gets us through. Yes. It gives us the courage and the strength to get through all sorts of things. And you know what? Even if you don't get the thing, it often turns out that you get something better or you go in a different direction. Right. And you find that you're happier. Absolutely. And as an independent professional slash artist, you know, every new job is an audition. And yes. sometimes you realize if you go with your gut. And I just had that happen for a big opportunity with me. You realize you know what this really doesn't feel right and so you move on and you realize well there you go that wasn't meant to be but gosh you're so right going with your gut and your intuition that's what that is it is yeah that is for anybody that's the best piece of advice because you'll say no you're supposed to reason it out well i've done that right and it seemed on paper or on the face of it this was a good move but my gut was saying no don't do it don't do it don't trust that person or this doesn't look like it's going to be what you want yes and so on and the intuition is always right yes it really is and the intuition and we can talk about this more later but the connection between intuition and subconscious are dreams a way of you know your intuitive being sort of playing things out and speaking to you is that maybe mm-hmm. what's going on here yes yes the intuition has a time while we're asleep to get through the barriers ah the conscious mind puts up barriers to protect us that's our ego right? right and so you know it often happens that you here you are right on the face of it you are clued in what to do you get your let's say the retroality tv website going mm-hmm. and so on you you know what to do you know how to do it you connect with people, you know, lots of people, and so on. However, when you let the barriers down at night, when uh, the subconscious can slip through, it'll say, (laughs) hey, we're going back to where we were when we were 19. Yes. 
Remember, you just have that panic uh-huh. and that, what the heck are we going to do if this doesn't work? You know, this is, you can get through it. It's learning to be confident in yourself. Yes. And if you don't get the thing, there's something else for you to do. That's right. the best part. Absolutely. You know, I like that you help me make sense of these Groundhog Day type dreams. Mm. This is a biggie. And, you know, I think sometimes consciously you can tell yourself, oh, I've moved on. I've learned and I'm different. But if there is still a little bit of a lesson left there for you to learn, I guess your subconscious will let you know that. Absolutely, yes. Thanks for uh, giving me another tool here with the lucid dreaming advice to slay that dragon. I appreciate it. My pleasure, dear. My pleasure. Reimagine That with Chris Mann was brought to you by Retroality TV. Copyright 2012 by Chris Mann. You can find us at Retroality.tv and at reimaginethat.libson.com. Tweet us at Retroality TV or join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Retroality TV. And don't forget to check out our TV channel at youtube.com slash Retroality TV. And let me clarify that the viewpoints expressed by the hosts and guests on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of this announcer. But then again, they don't necessarily not reflect the views of this announcer. But then again, they may or may not reflect the views of this announcer.